Um, thank you for joining our program, Using Objects of Intolerance to Teach Tolerance and Promote Social Justice, Lessons from the Jim Crow Museum. I know we have a number of museum people, professionals uh, on this call today, um, and many museums, and this is one of the reasons we really uh, reached out to Dr. Pilgrim, many museums have material in their collections, and many of them are honestly puzzled on how to use, interpret, or if they should. Uh, we've all seen this material. Some people may even have, have had it or seen it in their houses um, or other houses. So I personally am very, very interested in this. I teach, I think this is something that um, our um, students want to know about, um, our members of our museums want to know about. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, our speaker tonight, Dr. David Pilgrim. And again, thank you for coming. Uh, Dr. Pilgrim is one of the country's leading experts on issues relating to multiculturalism, diversity, and race relationships. He's an applied sociologist with a doctorate from Ohio State University and the author of a number of books, including Understanding Jim Crow and Watermelons, Nooses, and Straight Razors. His other writings appear on the museum's website. Uh, he speaks regularly. He has spent his adult life using objects of intolerance to teach about race, race relationships, and racism along with white supremacy. Um, he is uh, best known as the founder and curator of the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia, a 14,000 piece collection of artifacts located at Ferris State University in Big Rapids, Michigan. The museum uses objects of intolerance to teach tolerance and promote social justice. And we are here to learn some of those lessons. So Dr. David Pilgrim. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, um, that's very humbling. I, I don't take these opportunities for granted. Uh, it means a lot to me that someone would think that I have ideas that they would want to hear. So thank you for, for this invitation. And let's go ahead and get started. Uh, looking at that first slide, I think most of us are familiar with this quote. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you very much about the image. Uh, we found it on an old trade card. I'm assuming it was around 1900 or so. It is so powerful. Uh, the symbolism is, is, is great. Uh, if one of you in the audience has some information about that image, please send them to us at the Jim Crow Museum. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, a warning of sorts. Uh, this presentation does not include some of the most horrific images in the museum, but it does have images that some might find offensive. I don't include uh, uh, imagery just to titillate or provoke people. Uh, I do it because I'm talking about something and I need the person to see what I'm talking about. But I do want you to know that there are one or two images that you might find offensive. Next slide. Uh, I was in the museum one day and, um, you know, we have a lynching tree. Uh, according to the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, during the Jim Crow period, it just the southern states had over 4,000 African Americans who were lynched. I don't just mean hanged, but I mean publicly killed. Uh, the lynching tree is often used as a symbol of lynchings, actually the hangman's noose more specifically, but I was standing near the tree, standing in a section of the museum that deals with the relationship between violence and Jim Crow, because a system like Jim Crow, this racial hierarchy could not have existed without violence, real violence and the threat of violence and symbolic violence. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that this museum, with 14,000 pieces and growing each week was actually a testimony to the resiliency of African-American people. 
So I go through great lengths to tell people we are an anti-racism facility. We are not a shrine to racism. And then I realized instead of just saying that, what I really should be saying is, is that despite the objects in this museum, the segregation objects, the objects that caricature African-American people, despite all of that, African-Americans achieve great things in this country. Next slide. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born in Harlem. Um, Kenneth, I'm gonna take a chance here, although this is recorded, I'm gonna say something I probably shouldn't say, and I hope it's okay. If, if not, I'll just pretend <clears throat> I didn't say it, although I, I think you're recording. Um, I was born in, in, in Harlem, but at the age of one, uh, I was uh, reared or sent down to Alabama, Mobile. Um, and I bought my first piece when I was 12 years old. So here I am, um, someone whose ancestry is uh, from uh, Barbados, from Venezuelan, uh, indigenous people, African nations, and Spain. In other words, some of the nations that our previous president referred to as a shithole or shithole countries. And when I first heard him use that expression, I thought he was talking about Indiana. So that's the part where I probably shouldn't have said that. I wish I was in front of an audience right now, a physical audience to see how many people groaned and how many laughed. But anyway, I, I, here I am, this multiracial, black identified young man uh, growing up in Alabama at the end of the Jim Crow period. And I was at a flea market slash um, antique place slash carnival and a dealer had a lot of objects on the table. I purchased an object similar to one of these and broke it. Uh, next slide. So I don't know who that handsome devil is. Um, I spent most of my teenage years with this rather weird obsession with racist objects. Um, you know, uh, I collected uh, probably about 3,200 by the time I came to this institution. I went to all black high school, uh, went to a college which was historically black, uh, that being Jarvis Christian College in Hawkins, Texas. It was there that I learned that you could use objects as teaching tools. And it was also there that I learned some of the everyday lessons of life under Jim Crow for a person of color. And my collection was growing. I left there and I went to the Ohio State. Can it, don't just say Ohio State, it's the Ohio State. Uh, and, um, you know, studied among other things, race relations while I was there. Left and eventually came to Ferris uh, as a sociology professor. And I used to use the objects in my courses. So I taught a course in American minorities. I taught one intro to sociology and one I think was called race relations in America and I would bring in objects and I would use them because they're so powerful. In my experience, the two most consequential teaching tools that I've had other than the truth would be stories and objects. And when you put them together, uh, students don't forget what they've, what they've learned. And so in the mid 1990s, I approached the institution and said, so I have this collection of 3,000 or so objects. Do, do, do you have the courage to give me a space where we can work toward um, creating a learning laboratory? I didn't think of a museum at the time. And so they gave me a room that was 500 square feet. Uh, that's small, next slide. So that's the room. Uh, they built some shelving, uh, built some display cases, 500 square feet. Uh, we're getting ready to build a two-story standalone facility. That's, that would even be the size of most of the galleries that will be in there. But at the time, I was thrilled, right? Because I could bring my students in. You may not spend your time thinking about teaching pedagogy and uh, 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 
object-based learning and or any of those topics, but you can tell that there's some learning going on in this room. Um, you know, Ferris State University has the reputation of being an institution where we practice eyes on, hands on learning. Uh, most people, though, they would think of our program in well-being, uh, or print technology, or golf management. But I was teaching a course in American Minorities, and you can see that there is learning going on, eyes on, hands on learning. Next slide. So I had two fears. Uh, I was in that small room, and I knew that I wanted more than that. I knew that I needed to contextualize the pieces. Uh, we didn't have any didactic panels. The only signs we had were racist signs. And um, I wanted to move into a museum proper, but my fear was that it would never happen, that I would die before it happened. And uh, actually, next slide. Um, hey, I like the way that kind of slides in there like that. Uh, in 2012, just before we moved into the museum, I was actually in an accident and almost died. And not to be morbid or, or melodramatic, but uh, since that time, which would have been March 2012, you know, I have have this, this understanding that life is this blessed vapor uh, and that we need to be intentional about uh, the time that we have. Um, next slide. My other fear was that my, my elders, African Americans, a generation before me or two generations before me, that they wouldn't get it, that they would see this as a, a shrine to racism, that they would uh, be disappointed, uh, not just resistant, but actually dismayed. Uh, but that, that fear, um, did not realize, was not realized. Instead, I've had African-Americans uh, and others, um, civil rights groups, human rights groups, um, African-Americans who lived during the Jim Crow period come and thank us, uh, not just for preserving, but for documenting, using objects as documents of the past, uh, documentary evidence of the past. Next slide. So I see a big difference between safe and comfortable. Uh, there's a lot of talk these days about a place should be safe and comfortable as if those were synonyms, they are not. I believe that if you're gonna talk about uh, racism or sexism or um, a hatred uh, or discrimination against uh, LGBTQ plus peoples or peoples with disabilities or peoples from other countries, that that is uncomfortable, um, but it doesn't have to be unsafe. And so we use the, our objects um, to teach. By the way, uh, we also um, collect objects that defame, mock, and belittle other groups, like the groups I just mentioned. Some of that we put into traveling exhibits, but um, I'm also thinking about building other museums Next slide. So here are some of the things I've learned. Um, I guess this is, you know, it's like, these are things they don't teach you in museum studies programs. And I say that as if I know what they teach people in museum studies programs. I've never taken a course in museum studies. I'm sure I would benefit from it. But one of the the small lessons that has, uh, I think, profound consequences is that I have to remind myself that when people come into that facility, uh, most of the time, it's their first time in the facility. Whereas for me, I've been in there hundreds or thousands of times, and that has consequences. Next slide. So, you know, sometimes people use language uh, to ex express their experience in the museum, and it's metaphoric. So they'll say something like, uh, the object spoke to me, or I couldn't hear myself thinking because the objects were yelling. And you know, my background is in social science, which is not very metaphysical 
or metaphorical for that matter. Um, but I've come, I've come to this conclusion here that mentally and emotionally, there is something going on often when people come in and are confronted with these pieces because folks bring their prejudices. They bring their ideas, their tastes, their values. They bring their experiences and their interpretations of their experiences. They bring the subjective and the object. They bring all of that to the objects and it matters. So it's not, it's not a blank slate when someone's standing there. And if I understand that, then that means that's where I ought to begin. Next slide. So I just have to throw this in because I hear this a lot. So we're gonna have a question and answer part at the end. And so no one's gonna ask this because the example I'm using is that usually when there's a question and answer section, someone will say some variation of this, that if you stop talking about race, racism will go away. And of course, my response is that doesn't even make stupid sense. The reality is we talk about race all the time. We talk about it at the baseball games. We talk about it in the corridors of our workspaces. We talk about it in restrooms. We talk about it wherever we congregate, but we don't often talk about it in places where our ideas can be challenged. And so when someone says to me, can't we please stop talking about race? What they are saying or what I receive from that is, is that this is a difficult conversation. This is maybe for me, a painful conversation. This is a conversation that I need to have in a certain way. They're saying all of that. Now I must confess something. I have an advantage in terms of race-based dialogue. I have an advantage over most people I meet because when someone comes to the museum, they're expecting to talk about race, race relations and racism. And most of the difficult conversations that I've had in my life have been more organic than that. They've been at the supermarket. When I'm just trying to buy some food that I shouldn't be eating and somebody comes up to me and they have, and they just say something, right? Next slide. So this is a quote uh, from my brain. I'm not suggesting that it is especially profound, but it summarizes uh, a belief of mine. Americans like happy history, narratives that make us look smart, brave, and exceptional. We want a history that has been cherry picked, one that ignores our mistreatment of the weak and disfavored. A history that can be celebrated at picnics, parades, and in smug conversations. This approach to history is neither honest nor mature. So you see what I said. Let me tell you what I did not say. I did not say that, that there are no events, people, circumstances, outcomes, activities, whatever term you want. I did not say that the United States in its past that it does not have things that should be celebrated or even that are praised for it. I'm not suggesting that. What I am suggesting is, is that a, an accurate understanding of the past deals with all of the past. Next slide. So, and that's the, that's the tree that I was uh, mentioning earlier. I'm so glad for those of you that design museums, um, we made the decision to make the hangman's noose detachable, which was really smart because it's been pulled down three, 400 times. And, and not suggesting that it's done out of anger. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know why it's done. But the reason I show you this image is to make the point that's written here, which is when we study the past, it's to document what happened. It's not to make us feel good or bad. And I don't understand why it is that so many of us are resistant of looking at the past for, for what it was and trying to understand. So what actually happened? Next slide. 
you know, we're not a civil rights museum. Uh, we're not an African-American studies museum. I have a lot of love for, for those facilities. We are a museum that focuses on racism. And I make that point because recently, and by recently, I mean a couple of years ago, I think, we received uh, from an anonymous donor a collection of, of um, original photographs taken by Bruce Davison. Uh, who was at the time, you know, he, he was a, a, a young white photographer. I think he was like 21 or 22 during the Freedom Rides and uh, went down south, put his life in jeopardy and, um, you know, took these iconic images and we have the originals. Uh, of course, I don't know what we can do with, uh, like the one behind me is one of the images, but it's, it's all over the internet. So we obviously can't stop people from using them. Um, but I, I, I wanna share this because first of all, I felt really good that, that even though we're not a quote civil rights museum, that someone trusted us to be good stewards with this valuable historical collection. But I also tell it for a different reason. I mentioned that Bruce Davison was white and I did that for a reason. First of all, he was white. Second of all, we're now living at a time when I get emails and letters from young white scholars, historians, photographers, um, and others asking, is civil rights a story they can tell? And my answer to them is always the same and that is, it's all of our stories to tell, just do it right. Do it the same way Bruce Davison did. You don't need my permission to tell the truth. You don't need my permission to study in a certain area or discipline or even to take a certain theoretical approach. Just do it right. So I, you know, I, I can't, I'm likely to go off on a tangent here. And so I apologize. We have a mural here in the small town where, where my school is located. And it purports to be a sort of a history of the area in, in, in art or in paint through painting. And this is a logger town. And this, sorry, this is a logger town. And African-Americans were part of the logging community and yet none of them are reflected in the mural. And it's one thing to do history poorly in a history book, but when you do it poorly in a public mural, you compound the error. error, error. This is not a diversity issue. This is not an inclusion or equity issue. It's an accuracy issue. Next slide. So I think this is one of those hard lessons that I've learned and that is, we're always going to be doing this work. And I think that's sobering. It does not mean, um, like some of my colleagues, um, um, I'll take for example, uh, there is a uh, sort of a flourishing popular approach now called Afro pessimism, which basically starts with the premise that race and racism are so embedded in the fiber of this nation that it can never, it can never, it can never be eradicated. Uh, and then because it starts from that premise, uh, even if it's logical, it leads you to um, a conclusion where the, the best we can ever do is to mitigate the harm done by racism. So I don't accept that. Um, and I believe that we make progress uh, and that it will be many years before we get where we need to go. But I believe progress is possible. I think people get tired. I think they get fatigued. Next slide. So uh, we received some 
uh, oversized Polaroids that were created by David Leventhal. Uh, they're almost impossible to display because they're oversized Polaroids, uh, but they're also controversial. Now, these are the same objects, or the same imagery of the objects that are in the Jim Crow Museum, but it's hard to get a community to display them. I, I think we can, that'll be one of the things we can sort of talk about when we do the questions. Next slide. Um, you know, we've worked really hard at the museum to place some context around the objects. So I think we've done a good job in the facility itself of doing that. Uh, I put this up here because it brings back memories. We used to have, we wouldn't allow, this is when we were in that small room, we wouldn't allow anyone in that room who had not seen this documentary, Ethnic Notions. By the way, I think it's, it's like raw genius, this documentary. Uh, it's also an hour long. And so people like didn't have a lot of patience for having to watch an hour long documentary before they got in. Uh, and we eventually created uh, 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 our own shorter uh, introduction to the museum um, video. We still encourage people to visit our website to use some of the tools that are there before they come to have some discussions before they come. Um, but we don't force them to watch ethnic notions anymore. Someone just wrote, this is an amazing documentary. I agree with you. Next slide. So here is one of the big lessons that I don't think most people in museums need to hear this, but I'm positive most people in higher ed do. Um, what I've discovered is if you crush someone, you can't teach them after that. And not only can you not teach them, you can't teach anyone who witnessed it. And so does this mean that when someone comes into the museum and they are, you know, uh, combative or, uh, well, quite frankly, just wrong about something that, that they are not corrected? Of course not. It doesn't mean we don't push back, that we don't have engaged conversations. Of course not. But the cheap, cathartic crush, crushing of someone, you know, that's, that's not, learning doesn't occur that. This is such a hard lesson when we have faculty members who serve as docents because they need to be right. And, um, and again, that often results in, in a kind of crushing of, of, of someone's beliefs or someone's knowledge base. And, I, and if you learn nothing else, it's to not crush people. Next slide. So this is a thing that I learned, um, I think early on, and that is if an object has a racist slur in it, if it's heavily caricatured or there's violence in it, it doesn't lead to a lot of dialogue. Um, but objects like the dolls often lead to great dialogue. So we have much better dialogue, a more nuanced, engaged dialogue when we're talking about something like Aunt your Mama than when we're talking about lynching or when it's an ugly, coarse, obscene object. I don't know if, if people would just know that, uh, you know, and I'm just saying something that people would already know or not, but this is repeated time and again. Next slide. So in the museum, we use visual thinking strategies and um, I'm not an expert with it. Um, for me, you know, I, I guess it would be safer to say we use a version of it. Uh, and that is to ask people what they see. So this particular object is a license plate. That's significant for a lot of reasons. It's an everyday object. The thousands of objects that are in the museum, most of them are everyday objects. They have functions. They are ashtrays. What do people do with an ashtray? They put their cigarette out. 
They are wine glasses. They are toys and games and postcards. And uh, if you can think of an everyday object, I probably collected a racist version of it. And so it has, it has a multiple functions. The one, if it's an ashtray or a license plate, it has that function, but it also has a, a, a race function. And so in the 1960s, there was a lot of talk about the new Negro and the new Democrat. This license plate suggests that the new Negro, in this case, represented by a, a black rat who's supposed to be Martin Luther King Jr. and a white rat who's supposed to be Lyndon Baines Johnson, that they're still just rats. Now imagine that's on someone's, this is not like a, a, a whatnot or a souvenir that you leave in your, in your privacy of your home. This is on someone's car. Next slide. So if, if all I knew about African-Americans was what I saw in this postcard, what would I think of African-Americans? So that's a question. Um, of course, we would start with the one I gave you earlier, which is, so what's going on in this picture, right? Um, what does it say about the relationship between the child uh, and the alligator. What does it infer slash imply? I can never get those two straight. About um, the significance or the humanity of African and African American people. So we have a, a whole section of the museum that deals with this narrative of Black people as food for animals. In other words, they're not really at the top of the food chain themselves. Uh, they are food for animals. And we have it again in toys and games, in books, in songs, in cartoons, or right here in a postcard. And I don't know how many of you remember um, Miami Vice, um, but you know that's the show where the guy didn't wear socks. Okay, that was supposed to be fun. Anyway, um, the, there was a white police officer and a black police officer. And the white police officer had a, I think he called it a crocodile, but it's an alligator, uh, on his, as a pet. And the only people, it was like a running trope for that show. The only people that were afraid of that alligator were criminals and his black partner. Um, if you read the stories of David Crockett, you know, and him talking about eating, uh, you know, that he was part alligator and could eat a blank hole and the like. So, so many references in our music and the like about Black people as food um, for animals. Next slide. So this is um, one of uh, two dozen or so exercises that we use in the museum. You're welcome to take this. I mean, the museum uh, has from the beginning been um, a free resource to the world. I think we're gonna have to revisit the business model when we move into the new facility, but uh, I really like, uh, especially this one called uh, the placard. And I actually did this. I was in Canada at, at um, what's it called? Concordia University. And I had a group of museum professionals, right? So they, these are like very smart, focused folks. And so I divided them into six groups and I gave them an object. And first we did the storm, right? Where you just think of all, anything, and, and, and it's to stop you from censoring yourself is the purpose of that. And so just whatever's popping in your mind, just write it down. No one's judging you. No one's gonna be angry with you. Obviously, you have to be in a group that you can trust to do this. And I've been working with them for about two days before that. Um, and then we did the placket, which is my absolute favorite um, exercise. And it is, you then put them in a group of, I don't know, like eight or so people. And you tell them, here's your task. You have to come up with a placket 
that a visitor to the museum, all they're going to see in this section is the object and your placard. So you get 25 words. You as a group of eight or 10 people decide what those 25 words are, right? And, and then I, 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 then they go at it, right? So the interesting part about this is I don't care about the placard. But if the museum professionals, they were serious about coming up with the best placard that they could, right? I'm being a social scientist. My job is to get them talking to one another about what's important to say. Do you see where I'm going? So one person says, well, we have to describe, we have to say that this is racist. And someone else says, no, you can look at it and tell that me. Someone else says, you know, we can't trust that they don't know that it's racist. And the other person says, you know, we can hint at it's, and someone else, and it's going on and on and on. And uh, I just think it's a, it's a valuable uh, sort of exercise. Again, it wouldn't work every place. So the epilogue to the story, and I hope this doesn't get back to the people in Concordia, the epilogue to the story is story is that when we finished, because I had promised to select one of them as I'd like, you know, I want I want the best one. They were so driven by who who had the best placard, you know. So I think that's actually a good thing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with excellence. I don't ever want us to get to a place where excellence doesn't matter, but that really was the purpose of the uh, of the exercise. Next slide. So this was a this was a lesson long in the making for me. For years, I resisted um, adding things to the Jim Crow Museum that did not specifically document racism. So I didn't want to have anything in there about African-American achievement. I didn't have anything about African-Americans using their art to deconstruct racist imagery. I didn't have anything in there about the civil rights movement or about African-Americans in the military or political or great thinkers. I, I was like, that's not who we are. And I would go to conferences and I would end up, again, I'm, I believe in dialogue. I still believe in the triumph of dialogue. And I am still listening when people are talking, even when I disagree with them. And so I kept having these discussions with people whose opinions mattered to me. And then one day I was like, you know what? They're right and I'm wrong. The museum can't just be racist objects, even though that's on the title of the facility. It can't just be that. It has to show. African Americans pushing back. It has to show African American artists, you know, using their art to deconstruct racist imagery. It has to show African American achievers who achieved during the period of Jim Crow, who not only whose achievements were not limited to dismantling Jim Crow, but who did that and other things during that period. It has to show that. And it has to show the civil rights movement because at least on paper, that represented the end of Jim Crow. So we have, a, we have an ink pen in the museum. And there's a huge argument with our small staff, right? Because we know that it was held by, by President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, we know he did a good thing with it. We know that it was that what he signed into law, that that act mattered in the journey, the civil rights, human rights journey of this country. But we are equally split over whether it was used to sign the 1964 Civil Rights Act into law or the next year's Voting Rights Act. And we have people making good arguments about we have his signature on the the back of the box, we have all of that. So, but my point is, is that a Jim Crow museum ought to have pieces like that. And it took me a long time to get there. Next slide. So here's some odds and ends, things that I couldn't figure out a good segue to, um, but I, things I wanted to make sure I got that were said. Next slide. So we studied the past 
because it happened and because we live in the residue. And that's the point I want to make. We live in the residue. Doesn't mean we're not more democratic and egalitarian than we used to be, but there is still residue. Next slide. And this is some of the residue. Uh, if there is a race-based incident that occurs in the United States that receives any kind of national attention, there will be two and three-dimensional objects like that t-shirt that will be in the second, or actually in the primary market within a week or two. No exception. This is some of the residue. residue. People dress it in blackface. Um, the way our prison systems look. Next slide. So I've been talking, so now I'm going to sound a little contradictory here. And you're going to be like, well, make up your mind, my friend. So, you know, to be an activist is to lose most of the time. It is to spend most of your life failing. Um, I accept that. My mentors, when I was at The Ohio State, most of them who had spent their lives as like scholar activists, by the time I met them, they were, they were worn down. And often their personal lives having devolved somewhere. And I always believed Dr. King, this, this notion, this metaphysical, non-scientific, non-social scientific belief that the arc of the Mar universe is long, but it bends towards you. I needed to believe that. That even with the change being incremental, as I said earlier, that that yeah, it's not it's not a straight line. I mean it's up and down and it's sideways and sometimes damn it is backwards. But but it bends toward justice. And I needed to believe that and did believe that until a half decade ago or so. And then I started hearing a level of rhetoric that was reminiscent of when I grew up in Alabama and George Wallace was the governor. And it really shook me. And I had to wrestle with the idea of whether or not I too was going to become what is today referred to as Afro-pessimistic or Afro-pessimism. And then I saw young people uh, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. Um, at first it felt like a trickle and then it was like a fast train coming. And I thought, these are not our, these folks are not our best hope. They're our only hope. And I remember I do a little TV show and by little, I mean, we probably have 20 viewers, right? It's a campus TV show. And we were doing a show right after um, the, the protest following George Floyd's killing. And I was just tired. And not tired like today. I mean tired, tired, right? Rosa Parks tired. That kind of tired. And I had two young people on there, two students, and uh, I was explaining to them that you know, I'm tired. And one of them, all of 20 years old, looked at me and said, Dr. Pilgrim, we don't have time for you to be tired. We don't have time for you to be tired. Next slide. So the first work is always with us. Like I work with museums, I work with prisons, I work with police departments, I work with universities, I work with churches. Doesn't matter who you work with. Those are all organizations, but within those organizations are individuals. And the first work is to work with me, to find my blind spots, the places where, where, where I can do better, where I know I must do better. It's to work on me, to do an honest assessment of me. The director, the vice president of diversity and inclusion needs to look in the mirror, needs to ask hard questions of himself. Next slide. 
So that pitcher there, that is the pitcher uh, of Ferris Institute in 1920. It was lying on the floor, laying, lying. It was on the floor uh, in our archive uh, facility. And no one had ever done anything with it. As a matter of fact, we didn't even know. We teach history at this school. People get a check every two weeks to teach history. They get a check every two weeks working in archives. But we didn't know that this institution had had a history of African Americans in the early 1900s. That our founder, Woodridge Ferris, was a racial justice warrior before anyone would ever think to use those terms. And I mean that. I'm, I don't work for advancement in marketing. I'm telling you, we studied his life and we found out that he lived his life trying to create. Well, let me put it this way. I have shown people things that he wrote and said in the early 1900s, 1920, 1910s. And I've shown them what Martin Luther King said many years later. And they didn't know which person had said what. We have to create spaces where people believe they belong to them as much as it belongs to anyone else. So if someone, when someone asks me, so what is it, what's an inclusive space? That's easy for me. I mean, it may sound a little trite because I say it all the time, but it's a place where everyone believes that place belongs to them as much as it belongs to anyone else. It's not your museum. It's ours. It's not your school. It's ours. And this is before you bring an exhibit. This is before you do whatever. Else. This is about creating this, this accurate and earned belief that this is ours. Next slide. So I've also collected over 2,000 objects that belittle, fame, defame, and mock women. And this is a trade publication uh, from the early 1900s. And this was when women were trying to get the right to vote and being denied the right. And so this trade card is basically saying, you have no voice, we will give you no voice and more. And again, from my brain, it's not profound. If it requires courage to speak, there is something wrong with the situation, not the speaker. And there are no exceptions. I mean, there are times, unfortunately, when it does require courage to speak, but it should never require courage to speak. If it does, there's something wrong with that situation. We need to find ways to give voice to others. I'm so pleased that, I mean, we're, we are going to create, you know, also a museum of sexist objects. Actually, those 2000 objects I mentioned earlier, they're now in that small room that we used to be in. Next slide. So young visitors to the museum come in and say, what was it like to live during the civil rights struggle? I gently tell them that we are living during the civil rights struggle, but this happens less often now. And now they're leading. Next slide. So that's the museum we're gonna build. And uh, you, it, that is freaking amazing, Kenneth. You cannot tell me that that's not amazing. And what's really amazing It'll be the first building that people see when they drive onto the campus. And so it will be prominently displayed as a grand gesture by this institution. Um, and I'm excited. Next slide. So we're going to bring people. We already have people coming from around. We had people come from Australia because they wanted to build a similar facility uh, dealing with the, the way the indigenous people there, so-called aborigines are treated. We've had people come from around the countries and documentaries and others, um, but we want, we want to 
We want to be the place someone says, so where's Big Rapids, Michigan? I don't know. We're 12, 1300 miles north of Miami. Oh, okay, yeah, we're on our way. And then I want to end with this last slide and then I want to take your questions and engage you. Well, actually there's two. I wish H. Ross Perot, I wish he had not used gendered language with this, but the spirit of what he's saying, the activist is not the man who says the river is dirty. The activist is the man who cleans the river. So there are people, and I respect this, there are people that don't like our approach. They say it's too direct. It's too uh, dangerous. Um, it's too likely to go wrong. And I don't mind them saying that, but, but I will remind them that our pant legs are wet. I mean, we're, we're in the river. And if you don't like it the way we're doing it, then do it a different way, but do something, right? I mean, do something. And then the final slide. When I was growing up in Alabama, uh, I was always told, and I grew up in a poor, poor neighborhood, I'm not bragging or complaining, just stating the fact. And I, you know, you would see someone who was even, you know, who was quite frankly, had less than you did and, or who had some other challenge. And we were always taught, do not pity them. Do not, under any circumstance, feel sorry for that person. And when you're a child, that doesn't, you know, it doesn't make that much sense to you. And then when you get older, you realize this. And so I'll just leave this quote, compassion is not pity, not even empathetic pity. There is arrogance and haughty pride in pitying others. Compassion is when we are confronted with another's suffering and we suffer with them. Their pain is ours. We are motivated to relieve their suffering. When we feel true compassion, we help those who suffer, not as a cathartic release, but because it breaks our heart that they are hurting. Feeling sorry for a person didn't do anything for them. We only help others when we hurt with them. And that's whether we're talking about racism, sexism, classism, or any of the other isms that divide us. So I want to thank you. I got through that as quickly as I could, Kenneth, to leave some time for questions. I apologize if it was too fast. I should have, yeah, I'll leave it at that. No, David, it was, it was perfect. Just on time, leaving us uh, a good amount for questions. Uh, thank you really so much for your insights and uh, giving us another way of looking at a lot of this material and your approach. There's been a lot of wonderful comments in the chat about your presentation, um, and we do have a lot of questions, so I'm going to dive into those. Um, I'd like um, other people, if there's still time, to just put them in the Q&A, and we'll get through as many as we can. There are some that are very specific, David, there are some that are, are uh, more general. Uh, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm yeah, gonna give, me the, give me the specific ones. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start with a couple of the easy ones. I'll okay. pitch you those. All right. Um, and one from Susan is, are you digitizing the, um, let me get it up here because so many things are popping up now, the Davidson collection? Yes. And that will be available online? Yeah, so that's the challenge though. Uh, we're quite frankly, we're in the early stages of digitizing everything. So here's one of my chain, uh, challenges. People sometimes will take an, an image and then they will create a new racist object with it. And so uh, trying to figure out how to give the right people access to the imagery without um, create without giving the wrong people uh, opportunities to place bad images on t-shirts and uh, other things and then selling them on Cafe Press or Etsy or something. Right. Um, and Claire, we've, we've got a, a request for you to um, put Dr. Pilgrim up big. <laughs> <laughs> So we can see him better. So we'll we'll do that. There we go. Excellent. 
So um, another very specific question, then we'll get on to more, uh, more general ones. Are you familiar with the uh, Edward J. Williams collection at Feaster Gates Stony Island Arts Bank in Chicago, a collection of quote, negrobilia that yeah. makes use of stereotypical images of black people? Yes, I am. Have you worked with them? I, no, we have not. Um, so yeah, the short answer is we have not. Okay. Yeah. So let's get on to some of these other questions. And I'm going to give one that we've been thinking about. A lot of, uh, you know, I teach a class on historic sites. Um, mm -hmm. You heard from Claire. Mm -hmm. We have 37 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, a new one opening up this summer, which is an LGBTQ site, mm -hmm. uh, which will be our, let's see, one, two, three, fourth one. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of our sites has a piece of folk art, which is a weather vane. It's a large um, Native American. Mm -hmm. And there have been some people on staff who have been really uncomfortable with that portrayal. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's, a, it's the first thing that you see before you even get into the visitor center. So it's not really like interpreted. Um, how, how do you respond? How would we use something like that? And then I'm gonna, this is a two-parter. Mm -hmm. A lot of historic sites, and I see some questions from people, you'll, even if you're having a guided tour, you may have something in the corner in that historic site mm -hmm. that is racist, and mm -hmm. people will notice it, but it's not part of your regular tour. Mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with this kind of material? What is, what is your advice for someone yeah. so in that situation? Yep, yeah. so again, I have an advantage because of the, the nature of our museum we don't have to, we don't have to rationalize um, w why we use those images, right? Uh, so my situation is easier, and I and I, I accept that. Um, I'd also like to say that I I have rarely been in a museum where, if given exposure to their storage, I did not see objects that we that quite frankly, would be in a Jim Crow museum. And I would ask people, so what, what are you gonna do with this? Now, part of it was because I wanted the object, right? But the other part was because I wanted to be, in some instances, a part of the discussions about what should happen to this object. Because it's not doing, in storage, it's, it's not doing anything, right? It's not, it's, it's, uh, it's not a teaching tool. Uh, it's, it's just something, it's just one of the many things that someone accepted from people and they're not displaying. Uh, what I have also found is that, um, we, you, I'm trying to say this in a way that's not insulting or elitist, um, that there are places where I'm glad they didn't show it because I don't think they were willing to do the work necessary to properly contextualize not just the object, but the conversation that would go with the object, all right? And so I would, if someone brought me in, I would, I would want to know, like, are they willing to do the work with their staff, with their own education, all right? In, in, instead of just thinking of, of um, you know, what we can, how we can use this to educate the public, or what role does it, should it have in a tour or should it have in, in our scripts? My first set of questions would be like, you know, questions with the staff about their having engaged conversations about race, race relations and racism. That's the first part. So I'm not even entertaining the idea that we display the objects uh, until we've had those kinds of conversations because the kind of conversations that you're discussing in terms of, well, this person is saying it, that's what we should be doing, Kenneth. We should be having those and, and more of those before we decide what to do with the object and how to handle the object, all right? And then when we've had that discussion, then I wanna have it with the community. I wanna have it with not just the visitors to the museum, but the people that are near the community. I, who are, who are, who, you know, they may never come to the museum, you know, but start having engaged conversations. 
I mean, some of the best conversations I've had about race were held in, in a community, were actually held in museums, and we hadn't even gotten to the discussion of a particular object or a particular display. We were just building trust with the surrounding community, listening to them, right? And so again, this is not like an easy answer. It's not a quick answer, but I'm just saying that the work needs to be done on the front end. Now, if a piece is already in there, uh, if we're not at a point to have a discussion about that piece, I'm taking it out. And that's the short answer. See, I tell you, there's no way I could say that without sounding like a know-it-all. And that's not, what I, that's not the way I wanted that to come up. No, not 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 to, not to worry. This is this is good for us to hear good advice. And I think you may have answered this question in just the last one. Um, someone wrote, "How do I get over the paralysis that overcomes me when I'm afraid I'm afraid to say the wrong thing?" And I think you just said it's in the training. Well, a little bit, and it's also the fact you know. Again, I here's one of my challenges. I've had to learn over the years to shut up. And that's been like a really, um, um, you know, that's, 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 that's hard for me because, you know, I was a college professor. I, I thought I knew what I was talking about. I was a researcher. I thought I, and, and, and thought I needed to resolve every puzzle that was in front of me. And then I think the visual thinking strategies piece helped me because it meant that I stopped talking and just became the person who facilitated discussions, uh, you know, uh, among others. Because the reality, Kenneth, is this. When you, when you have a certain position, when you start talking, you kill the rest of the conversation, right? I mean, people are like, they're, you know, because you wrap it up, right? You, you know, you, you are the one who makes it all make sense. And so for me, my challenge was, okay, just shut up and listen. Okay, let someone else do this part. Let someone else say that. Trust that we can get there. Um, so that's, that's been an ongoing sort of struggle for me and recognizing that there are people who come into the museum who don't say anything, but that doesn't mean they're not learning. It doesn't mean they're not processing. Um, that's, that's who they are, that's where they are, right? Um, unfortunately, to now is now that ten minutes have gone by, and I've been trying to answer this question. I finally get to it. the The reality is is that we're living at a time when a lot of people are worried about what they say, and worried that it'll come off as racist or sexist or homophobic or whatever. Uh, and that's why so much of this this the professional development. I hate the term training, but uh, it it has you. We have to first work you know, on just the trust part. Again, it sounds so mawkish and trite, but we have, we have to work on creating spaces where people are, are safe, even if uncomfortable. Um, and actually there was, that's great because that was actually one of the questions that came up so that you're, you're answering uh, lots, lots of them that way. Um, great. Um, I'm just, there's, there's so many here. You mentioned that images, objects that depict violence or very outwardly racist icon, iconography uh, tend to get less dialogue in the museum space. How, yeah. how then do we best get visitors to engage with these objects? Or they have a, this long, yeah, yeah, or do yeah. we yeah. turn, uh, or do we in turn choose not to display them or simply understand that they need to be seen but not engaged with? Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be engaged. Uh, I'm just saying it's more difficult um, because we have a section of the museum that shows the relationship between violence and Jim Crow. So it's not just the lynching tree that's in there. There's some, um, uh, there's like three clan robes, uh, it, you know, on mannequins. Um, there's, you know, games where you threw and hit uh, a black person, an actual black person, not a plastic or wooden, whatever. But um, so we recreated that. 
Um, it's just a really tough room. And, and there's just not a lot of dialogue because I think, that, you know, uh, unless you're the most extreme ideologue in the country, you recognize that that, that was going too far, you know? Uh, but then when you get to the kitchen we have, where there's, um, you know, three or 400 or, or more, you know, uh, syrup or pancake mix or whatever, you're like, okay, so what's wrong with this, right? Uh, it's, this is not offensive. Matter of fact, it's the opposite of offensive. It's, this is in a, in a nostalgic, right? This is me remembering time that I spent with my grandparents or my, my, my uh, parents and uh, it's just good memories. And then someone else though is looking at it and thinking, uh, yeah, this is reminding me of, of enslavement and segregation. So the, if you forgive the, the, the phrase here, the stable genius of the museum is that it brings those different groups together so that they can listen to one another. Um, the best example of this working, I was in a Western Michigan, it was an art class. I think all the students presented as white Americans. Uh, there was a colleague there, Khalid El Hakim, who had a black doll and he uh, went to his car and got it for me. We passed it around. And it was just, you know, I said to them, you don't know me, so you don't know me to trust me, but I'm going to ask you to trust me for a minute. And, I, I, and no one's going to jump on you and no one's going to be harsh. Um, but I just want you to tell me what, what it is you see when you see this. And so we passed the doll around the room. I wish I had videotaped it because it was the most amazing thing. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm often amazed that people reared in the same culture often in the same communities that, that they see race so differently. But the value of it was that they got to see that other people saw it differently. And I think that's the power of objects. Right. So uh, I've got a specific question here from Tripp. Um, it's about an object how would, might you approach teaching an object that contemporary viewers would find painful or objective, but wasn't intentionally racist when it was produced? Yeah. And, you know, there's many images of yeah. abolitionist images of kneeling supplicant enslaved yeah. men yeah. and women. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, context is everything. But my first response, and I'm, I'm, I, I didn't want to be flippant, but my first response would have been, that's almost everything in the museum. Right, I mean, because uh, I truly believe that there are many, remember now, most of our objects are everyday objects, the things that you would have found in people's homes, the ashtrays, the postcards, the toys, the games. I, I'm sure that at some conscious level, people weren't, you know, you know, weren't meaning to be as racist as they were actually being at the time, right? But they would be seen, um, it, would be, it would be viewed with, with some, you know, disgust today, right? And actually, here, here's a thought, kid. I'll put it this way. That's actually a sign of progress, right? The, the, the disgust that we feel looking at those objects is a sign of progress, right? So there's that. The other part is we have in the museum contemporary objects. And so despite our name, you know, you would think with our name, we would just be objects from you know, from the 1870s to the 1960s, but we actually have objects that were made two weeks ago or a year ago. And so the fact that we have contemporary objects, uh, that, um, you know, forces someone to recognize that some of those old caricatures and the stereotypes that accompanied the caricatures, that those things have morphed into the present. Right. Uh, I've got a great question uh, from our former curator at Historic New England, shout out to Laura Johnson, that says she's grateful for this talk in your work, Dr. Pilgrim, but she'd love to hear more about, I think this goes, holds true for a lot of us, about being white 
in doing work of racial justice and using objects to teach the history of racial injustice. She says it's difficult for her, it's difficult for me mm -hmm. to feel comfortable with as a white museum professional. Sure, that, that's, first of all, there's not gonna be an easy answer to that one, but I will share this with you. Um, our primary docent uh, is white and, and Australian. She's a, a newly naturalized uh, American citizen. And I've been trying to get her to uh, write about her experiences um, as the docent because that's that's front line. You know what I'm saying? That's not. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that the director or the curator, you know, is not having the same, you know, and not having challenges in the guard. But when you're the white person standing in front of 18, 60 year old African Americans from Detroit and you're talking about Jim Crow, there are some challenges there, right? And uh, I will share with you that she is such, she is so professional. She just actually finished a, a master's at Kent State, but she's so professional and so thoughtful and personally mature that, I, you know, I wouldn't know the statistics, but I would say it's, it's very uncommon for her to run into problems, you know, with the group. Now, of course, we are living in highly racialized uh, times, so there will be some of that. Um, so that I wanted to give you an example before I tried to answer your question, which is, here's my answer. That's, that's the topic of the conversation, or that's a topic of a conversation, first with the staff and then the community. In other words, what we've tried to do in the museum is we take the hardest challenges or the most difficult challenges that we have, and we make that the source of the lecture. We make that the source of the conversation. We have that conversation with the Black church or that conversation with the, 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 the Latin, whatever it is, right? And it's in the, again, I'm, I'm, I'm an old professor, so I believe in a tribe of dollar. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna give like techniques for doing it, right? Although if I talk to Cindy, she always says, you know, that she first starts off by emphasizing that, you know, she is, that this is an anti-racism facility, that she did not grow up in this country, that she has not shared, she does not have the same shared experiences and that she has no need to center herself in the lived experiences of others. But what she can do is facilitate a tour of the, of the material evidence of the Jim Crow period, right? So, so there's that. But it's, right. this, is not, this is not a, you know, I've been criticized because um, almost every docent we've ever had, our education, um, our education um, coordinator uh, who meets with the schools of is, is a young white, uh, a woman. Um, the primary docents are, um, you know, so this is a discussion we have all the time. And we also have it when the black groups are in there. So we had this same discussion with second, you, you, you don't probably know Michigan, but, uh, you know, Second Baptist Church is one of the leading um, uh, civil rights uh, churches in, in the history of Michigan. Uh, and they brought a group there and I came over one day. And so you had a group of 60, uh, which is too big for us, but 60 um, uh, African-Americans who lived during the Jim Crow period. And I came over and um, I w wanted to talk about race and representation and whatever. And they were like, uh, baby, that young woman did a great job. But yeah, this is this is a tough one. Well, uh, uh, what about the reaction of defensive white visitor? Again, these are you know, um, the, you know, this is going to happen in the classroom. It's going to happen in the church. It's going to happen in the grocery store. The best we can do is to be as uh, as accurate as we can be, as upfront as we can be. I did make a recent concession. Um, 
both on our web presence uh, and before you enter the facility, created some signage, digital and otherwise, explaining um, you know, what, you, what you're getting ready to see in case you didn't know uh, and, and asking you to sort of think about some things before you come in. I never thought I would do that. Um, but again, the last four or five years, the, uh, the sort of the racial climate in the country has changed. Right. So there's uh, one, one comment there from a historian who's actively collecting this material and uh, wants to place some of it. So um, he should contact you directly, correct? Yeah, he should. Uh, now, um, we are creating a 3,500 foot traveling exhibit. And uh, I mentioned that because we got to the point where we were, um, where we just had too much material. Um, we are receiving, um, I think we've gone, even during COVID, of days where you can get mail, so not Sundays and not holidays, we've been over 500 days consecutively where we've received at least one box, and often it's many more than that, um, from somebody somewhere in the world. And uh, I'm always excited because I spent my life as an obsessive collector, uh, but I'm not the one having to a session. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the one having to write little, you know. I, the I, curators I, will appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not the one doing that. Uh, so I, you know, I'm like, oh, wow, this is really great, right? And uh, they're like, um, you know, I think, I think now we're getting, we're probably getting, well, at least a few hundred um, and sometimes up to five or 600 objects a month. So I'm not saying we don't, we wouldn't use it because we are creating that huge traveling exhibit, which to me is huge, 3,500 square feet. And we're also going to be moving into a new facility. And in that facility, we're going to, we're going to take um, um, visual storage um, to another level in terms of being able to display the stuff that we archive. So I'm gonna. Uh, we've we've gone a little past time. I, there, what? there's so many, what? there there are, there are so many more questions, but um, I do want to ask this one from Remco. Um, the you've talked about actively collecting um, objects that are reflective of other isms. Mm -hmm. um, at, will at that some point overshadow the original collection and in intent? Yeah, I, uh, boy, this, uh, you, you saved that one to the last. I, I, I've, I've gotten that uh, question almost, in, almost, as a, um, almost as if the person is suggesting that it's going to happen, that it's inevitable in some way. And, that, and I even got from people that I had diluted their initial um, sort of, you know, goal by in some way equating the, the, the mistreatment of African-Americans with others. And I just, I don't see it that way. I, um, I, I believe that the United States benefits from having a Jim Crow museum, uh, including one that collects contemporary stuff also. And I think that in the same way, we would benefit from a sexism museum. I mean, the US has women's studies museums. It has women achievement museums, but it doesn't have a sexism museum. And quite frankly, the museums that deal with other groups, they may have like a really small uh, section, like a showcase sometime, but, but it's not their focus. I believe that we will be a better nation when we deal with the isms. And, um, you know, so that's, you know, that's the work I do. Right. 